Hi guys, welcome back. Today I am here with my October wrap up. October has ended up being a pretty good reading month for me. I read quite a lot in the second half of the month. If you are new to my wrap-ups, the way that these are structured is I always start out by talking about my reading stats for the month, and then I talk about all of the books that I read, starting with my lowest rated books and DNFs, or books that I did not finish, moving up to my highest rated books. For the books that I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up, of which there were 10 of them, I will not be going into detail on those books, I'm just going to be telling you the star rating. So if you want to hear my detail thoughts on any of the books that I mentioned from the first half of the month, you can check out my mid-month wrap-up, which I will link up above if you guys want to go and watch that video. So in the first half of the month I read 10 books, in the second half I read 15, so I actually did a lot of reading. And so let's go ahead and dive right into my stats. In the month of October I read 25 books, which is up from the last couple of months, for a total of 8,751 pages, and that page count does include my audiobooks. This month 14 of the books that I read were either ARCs or books that had been sent to me for review, which is a little bit on the high end, but I'm also about to close out the year and I'm trying to get through a lot of those ARCs right now. I had two DNFs this month, which I will talk about. And in terms of the goal that I set for myself at the beginning of the year, no surprise, like the one goal that I'm consistently failing at is reading translated fiction. I did not read any translated fiction this month. However, I did read one indie book and one nonfiction book. This month, three of the books that I read were graphic novels. One book was a reread for me and five books were from my library, all of which were audiobooks. And speaking of audiobooks, in the month of October I listened to 10 audiobooks. Eight of those books are what I term shelf, which means that they were already sitting on my TBR shelf. Many of them were backlist titles, but I also had some arcs in there that I was late to the game with and ended up listening to via audio. In terms of where those audiobooks were coming from this month, five of them were from my library, two of them were from Scribd, two of them were from Audible, and one of them was a audio review copy through the Penguin Random House Volumes app. In terms of age breakdown, I am pretty much right on target. This month, 11 of the books that I read were targeted at an adult audience, 12 of the books that I read were targeted at a YA audience, and two of the books that I read were targeted at a middle grade audience. Very happy with that breakdown. I like to try to do about half and half in terms of YA adults and then sometimes throw in some middle grade books, so this was it, exactly what I was going for. Now let's talk about genre breakdown. This month I went hard on the fantasy. You might remember that last month I read less fantasy than I normally do. This month 12 of the books that I read were fantasy, so we are back in the game guys, and it was a good month for fantasy, let me tell you. This month I read two romance novels, I read two sci-fi, two literary fiction, one contemporary fiction, one historical fiction, one mystery, one nonfiction, one paranormal, one poetry, and one superhero book. So lots of fantasy this month and a little bit of everything else, which is like pretty typical for me. Often I will read a little bit more romance than I did this month, but I'm pretty happy with this. Finally, let's talk about star ratings. I read a lot of really great books this month, which is exciting. I didn't have a lot of major flops. I didn't give out any one or one and a half stars this month. I did have two books that I gave two stars, one book that I gave two and a half stars, three books that I gave three stars, one book that I gave three and a half stars, six books got four stars, so that was the biggest category this month, a lot of four star reads, like solid but not amazing amazing, um, which is pretty good honestly, I'm really happy with that. Five books got four and a half stars from me, five books got five stars, and finally this month I gave two books six stars, which in my personal rating scale means that they are either a favorite of the year or a favorite of all time. Um, so yeah, that's pretty dang exciting. All right, with that said, let's get into the books. So like I said, this month I had two books that I DNF'd, which is lower than last month, so I guess that's good. One of them I did talk about in my mid-month wrap-up, and that is I'm Not Dying With You Tonight by Kimberly Jones and Gilly Siegel. If you're interested in hearing my thoughts on this and why I chose to DNF it, go check out my mid-month wrap-up. The other book that I DNF'd this month is The Summer of Sunshine and Margot by Susan Mallory. So this is kind of a blend of women's fiction and romance. 
I got a ways into this and just decided I couldn't deal with the way that one of the tropes in this book was being handled and this really may be more of a personal thing. This is about two sisters who are quite different from each other kind of dealing with their issues and I think finding love is probably where the book ends up going. One of the sisters works as a full-time live-in nanny and her newest charge is the son of a widow and it's very clear from pretty early on that there's a romance that's going to develop between her and the kids dad. Now in this case you might be thinking this is an age difference thing. That wasn't my problem with this. She's like 31 or 32 so she's not actually that much younger than the dad is. Um, I just find it really really creepy reading about him like checking out his hot nanny and knowing that it's wrong and that he shouldn't and she's living alone in this house with him and his son and I just like it creeps the hell out of me. I know it's supposed to be like sexy but I, I couldn't. So I was like um yeah I think I'm just gonna down off this one. Uh, so yeah. It's interesting, this is actually the second Susan Mallory book that I have DNF'd this year, so I'm wondering if maybe she's just not the author for me, which is fine. I know a lot of people really enjoy her, and if that doesn't bother you, you might like this, but I just couldn't do it, so that was a DNF for me. Moving on, let's talk about my two star reads, and there were two of them this month, so the first one is a graphic novel. Okay, so there is a story behind this. The graphic novel that I'm going to show you is a another take on a well-known book from a different character's perspective. Now, I read this book years ago and hated it. It was like one of my least favorite books I've ever read, especially because of the way that it was pitched to me and it was not what it was pitched to me as. Um, so years go by, this series gets very popular and it's turned into a TV show that gets very popular and I start thinking, ah, you know, like my reading tastes have changed, maybe I should try this again somehow. And then this opportunity came up to have an advanced copy of this graphic novel and I thought, oh perfect, maybe my feelings will be really different and maybe I'll love this because I like a lot of like darker fantasy things. Um, let's go into this with some fresh eyes and see how I feel about it. Well, you see how that turned out for me. So we're going to talk, talk about this. The graphic novel, I won't leave you in suspense any longer, the graphic novel is The Magicians, Alice's Story by Lev Grossman and Lila Sturgis. Okay, so I know, I, I know there are people who really, really love The Magicians, and I know there are other people who I'm friends with who also hated it as much as I did. Um... <sighs> So this is a book that was originally sold to me as Harry Potter Goes to College, and it's not that. Like, if you've read the book, you know that it is super depressing and gritty, and all of the characters pretty much are horrible. So I, I will say this. I gave The Magicians one star. I gave this two stars. So I did like it better, with some caveats. The best thing about this graphic novel is that it was not from the perspective of Quentin because Quentin is completely insufferable. He is the quintessential privileged white guy who's depressed and does a lot of navel, navel gazing and thinks that we should care about his poor life decisions. Um, uh, all of the characters pretty much are kind of horrible. Alice at least had potential. There were things that I really liked about her and liked about her story but ultimately the way that this ended and I mean it's of course it's gonna end this way I think I had just forgotten kind of exactly how things end up for her so spoilers if you don't want to hear anything but I was just like so mad that the ending of this is a woman not and not only a woman but a woman of color whose only purpose in existence is to sacrifice herself so that these privileged white bastards of men can come to their senses and realize that they have issues and maybe they should change and become better people. Like, that's why she exists. Ew! <laughs> I'm sorry, I just 
hate it so much. I gave this one two stars because the first part of this I did like a lot more. I appreciated Alice's perspective and I think she is an interesting character and has a lot going for her but ultimately I'm like why? Why would you stay with these people? I just I don't understand and I hated the ending. Um, so anyway this was a good reminder to me of why I hated the magicians as much as I did and no I'm not wrong it's it's the same thing they're like really insufferable people um but if you liked the magicians maybe you would like this too but I'm really mad about like the way Alice was used for that purpose okay now I will be done ranting about the magicians <laughs> and we'll rant about another book <laughs> Whew, yeah, like I didn't have a lot of low rated books this month, but the ones that I had were doozies. So yeah. All right, so the other book that I gave two stars this month, and honestly, I'm I've been back and forth about whether this is one and a half or two stars. I feel like I'm generously giving it two stars be, partly because it's a debut, but I I had trouble with this book, guys. I thought I was going to love it, so I'm kind of disappointed, but this is Lifestyles of Gods and Monsters by Emily Roberson. Okay, so, um, if you want to, like, know a lot of details about this and, like, all the content warnings and everything, I did write a pretty detailed review on Goodreads. In fact, I write reviews for all of the books that I read on Goodreads, which is always linked down below if you guys want to check that out. Um, I liked the premise of this and I liked what it was trying to do. The execution, like, I really struggle with. So this is basically being pitched as Greek mythology meets the Kardashians. And that's kind of what it is, which in theory I think sounds like a really cool idea. This is retelling the myth of Ariadne and the Minotaur combined with a reality TV show. The way that this was done was kind of an interesting choice that took me a while to kind of get used to and I'm not sure it was necessarily the best one in a few different ways but um, but essentially this is like transplanting the original characters with all of their names and most of the elements of the original Greek myth into a quasi modern day with some big caveats that we're going to talk about setting with modern language and clothing and stuff where it's all set on a reality tv show if you're not familiar with the myth ariadne there's a lot of like really messed up stuff in greek mythology but ariadne was the daughter of a king and she has a half brother who is the minotaur who is like half man half bull and the reason he exists is because the gods made her mother go crazy and be really into this like magical white bull and mate with him and so that is what resulted in her brother so all of that is in here so like you get like the bestiality thing one thing i am glad that she did avoid is the original myth definitely has some like incestuous overtones to it and thankfully that was not put in here However, plenty of other things were. So in the original, the king sets up this thing where every year 14 of the best and most beautiful young people from Athens are sent to compete to go into this maze and try to kill the Minotaur and every year they all die. Um, until one year a prince of Athens comes and Ariadne, who is the keeper of the maze and is the only person who the Minotaur doesn't try to eat, falls in love with him and um, decides to help him and he ends up killing the Minotaur and it's really tragic. So in this version all of that is then turned into a reality TV show. People are watching kind of all of the Hunger Games, these teenagers getting killed off every year in a pretty gruesome way in this maze by the Minotaur. All of this is told from Ariadne's perspective. So that is like an interesting idea. Interesting but kind of horrifying <laughs> in some ways. The issues that I really had with this were things that I felt like were not handled with enough delicacy and there was like some major content here. Um, that I was so uncomfortable with. I almost stand after this a lot of times. It is very readable though. It's a quick read so I did end up finishing it but um oh boy. Um so basically we have not only this thing of like televised children getting killed but we also have things like her parents forcing or pressuring her and her sisters into doing things like getting drunk on television, getting sexually involved with men, including with her sisters, sometimes much, much older men for power reasons on television, and showing nudity on television, all of this with children. Um, 
Ariadne is 16 years old. There is one of the competitors who's talked about as being really sexually desirable and wears these sexy clothes and is hooking up with all these guys who is 13 in this book. Um, and it's implied that her sisters had these things happening to them much younger. Um, and none of that is necessarily portrayed as good or okay, but I also felt like it was not treated as what it really is, which is like child abuse in the worst possible way, child pornography. Um, it's bad. Like it's really, really bad and horrifying. And um, yeah, I was kind of a little shocked, honestly, that like some of the stuff made it in here. I feel like it needed to be handled more carefully and or age up the characters because they're still, I mean, it wouldn't have been okay then either, but like, yeah. Um, and it's set in this world that's like modern-ish, but apparently nobody has rights. Like women and children don't, there's no way out. There's no like negative, real negative ending for the people engaging in these things at the end of this. I just like, I really, really struggle with that. And then on top of it, Ariadne is totally this not like other girls trope where she's somehow better because she's not into like makeup and fashion like her sisters. I don't know, like it was just, oh boy, so many things about this that I really, really had a problem with. Um, yikes. So be, you know, reader beware. <laughs> I liked the project of this. I love the idea of bringing Greek mythology into a more relevant setting. I think putting this on reality TV was a really interesting idea, but some of the execution, guys, yikes. Um, it was a lot. It was a lot. And I think just because of the content, some people are going to want to avoid this. I gave this one two stars. <laughs> like read at your own risk. Okay, moving on, I had one book that I gave two and a half stars, and this is a book that I talk about in my mid-month wrap-up. It was a romance novella called The Matchmaker's Mistletoe Mission by Jackie Burton. If you want to hear more about it, check out that video. This month there were three books that I gave three stars to, and two of them you can hear me talk about in the mid-month wrap-up. Those books were A Match Made in Mehendi by Nandini Bajpai, and McTrump, a Shakespearean tragicomedy of the Trump administration, part one by Ian Dosher and Jacopo de la Garcia. So if you want to hear about those books, check out my mid-month wrap-up. The other book that I gave three stars this month was my indie pick for the month, and this is a book that was sent to me for review. It is Her Crown of Fire by Renee April. This is being published in November by a really small new indie press, and it is a debut novel by a Australian author. I wrote a pretty in-depth review of this on Goodreads, which I'm going to recommend you maybe check out below if you want to hear a lot of details on this. But basically, this was an interesting book because I had a lot of critiques of it, just in terms of structural things and the writing and the pacing and the way the plot fit together and stuff. But at the same time, I had a really good time with it. It's one of these books where I'm like, I can objectively see that there are like lots of flaws and lots of places where the author can grow as a writer moving forward. But at the same time, it was a lot of fun. And for the most part, that didn't really detract from the reading experience for me. In some ways, this kind of feels like a throwback, which is interesting. It is a YA portal fantasy about a girl who's like not really anything special in our world for in Australia, then starts developing this ability with magic, falls into another world where all of a sudden she matters a lot, and it's a really dark and brutal world. So what's interesting about this is I feel like right now, this structure of a story, just in terms of that like portal fantasy stuff is more of what I'm seeing published in middle grade. I feel like traditionally you're not seeing much of this published in YA these days, but the content is much darker. So the content doesn't feel middle grade at all. It definitely feels older, but I don't know. It's just interesting. So I think because of that, it feels a little bit like a throwback and it's a lot of fun. It's a little messy. Not all of the different plot things always come together cohesively. And sometimes there's things that she does that I'm like, Hmm, that's an interesting choice. Okay. And I did want more character development. I feel like there's so much focus on all of these moving pieces with the plot that the relationships feel underdeveloped. I appreciated the fact that our main character is, I think, based on this bisexual, and there is a female-female romance that develops near the end of the book, but because it's so plot driven, that kind of came out of nowhere and I was like, okay, I want to be happy for this, but like okay, <laughs> like this is happening now, I guess. Um, 
and I, I just think that's like a lack of character development like a lot of the focus is on the plot there's also a character death that I thought could have been more impactful emotionally um but like all of that said I had a pretty good time reading it so yeah it's the first book in the series the ending is like will leave you with a lot of questions I would definitely read on like I'm curious to know what happens next we're left with a lot of unanswered questions and I'm like wait what that's how it ends what's next I need the next book so yeah like don't go in expecting perfection like it's definitely a little bit messy and it's definitely like a debut novel that could do with some cleaning up but it's a good time so if you like why a portal fantasy and you don't mind something that's a little bit darker I would go check it out then this month I had one book that I gave three and a half stars and um, this is actually one of two books in the same series that I read this month so even though I rated them differently I'm just going to talk about them both here together. The book that I gave three and a half stars is The Winner's Crime by Marie Ritkowski. This is the sequel to The Winner's Curse by Marie Ritkowski which I gave four and a half stars and talk about in my mid-month wrap-up. Um, so I am in the process of reading these. I'm planning on finishing out the trilogy in November so that I can read my arc of the new duology that she has coming out next year that's set in the same world. So these are really like a political fantasy romance that's super, super slow burn um, with some like interesting plays on power dynamics and lots of intrigue and stuff. I was super into book one. It was a whole lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. I liked the way the relationship developed. I thought the world was really interesting. I was very into it. I gave it four and a half stars. Um, is it perfectly written? No, but it was it was fun. Really liked it. Then I read book two, uh, Winner's Crime, and for whatever reason I just didn't connect with this as much as book one. It's fine. There's a lot that happens. There's a lot of court intrigue. It's pretty well written. I just like found myself kind of plodding through a lot of it um, more so than book one. I don't know that there's like a particular reason for that. I did listen to these on audio. Um, yeah, so I don't know. Like I don't know specifically what to tell you about it. I just like I think my review of this is also really short because I just it was fine. I didn't have much to say about it. I am happy I'm reading these. I'm interested to see how it wraps up. Yeah, not new favorites, but I'm glad that I'm getting around to reading them. All right, moving on to my four star reads. I had six of them this month, which is a lot. And two of them are books that I talked about in my mid month wrap up. Those are Whispers of Shadow and Flame by L. Penelope. This is the second book in the series, the sequel to Song of Blood and Stone, and the graphic novel Stage Dreams by Melanie Gilman. My next four star read was actually a reread and a buddy read with Kathy Treadhart. This is Six of Crows by Leigh Bardugo. So I read this years ago when I did not know that it was connected to her other books. I just kind of picked it up and read it because it looked interesting. I liked it fine. I gave it four stars. Then earlier in this year, I finally went back and read her original Grisha trilogy and have read King of Scars and then always intended on going back to reread Six of Crows and read Crooked Kingdom for the first time, which hopefully maybe will happen in November. So I listened to this one on audio and it was still a four star read for me. I think I appreciated it more the second time around and got more out of it just because I now knew the world. I think going in without knowing anything about the world or the magic system, I was, it took me a while to, the first time around to kind of figure out what was happening. And so I think now having that background, a lot of things made more sense. I think what really stands out in this book is Leigh Bardugo's character development. The characters that she creates in here are so good and so iconic and I think there's a reason that the series is so beloved and the diversity that she put in here before it was as much a conversation in YA I think is really impressive. We have these teens who are dealing with trauma and PTSD and trying to create a family, a found family together and it's really beautiful. And we have a character who's disabled, we have queer characters, we have characters of color. It's just really, really wonderful. The reason this was not a five star read for me is I think just because heist books are not so much my thing. It's fine, like I think for what it is, it's written well and I liked the character development enough that it really pulled me through. But some parts of it I'm just like, okay, this is fine. It's just not my favorite genre to read. So I think if you do like heist books, this one is well worth picking up. Um, for me, this was still four stars, but I'm happy that I reread it and now I'm ready to read Cricket Kingdom. I do know because I read King of Scars, like, 
some of the big things that happen in Crooked Kingdom, but like I'm not a person that's that bothered by those types of spoilers, so it's fine. I still want to read it. My next four star read was the Patreon book club pick of October. We read this as a group. This is A Madness So Discreet by Mindy McGinnis. I really liked this. I feel like we had some varying feelings on it within the group. A lot of people really enjoyed it. Some people had more issues with it. I can kind of see both sides, but I think if you're looking for a creepy historical fiction with some mystery elements to it that really deals with gender and mental illness, this is a fantastic pick. I will say it is pretty intense, especially the first 50 pages. There's going to be some really big trigger warnings in here. So I didn't quite know some of the things going into this. What I did know is that it's about a young woman who is in an asylum because she is pregnant. And this is a thing that would happen. Women were put in asylums for a whole lot of reasons back in the day because of powerlessness. And so she is there, we find out pretty early on, so this is not really a spoiler. She was abused by her father, so there is this theme of dealing with sexual abuse, incestuous sexual abuse, and her father is horrible. So yeah, that's a thing in here. It's pretty intense. There is also going to be trigger warnings in here for a lot of other stuff. Murder, mistreatment of patients in a mental institution, violence generally, like violence against women's bodies, including her while she is pregnant, her loss of a child for, I mean, there's a lot. There's like a lot in this. This is a intense, dark YA book, but I think it's also really good. There's some really beautiful moments about friendship and like what does it really mean to have this madness and um, yeah, anyway, I really liked it a whole lot. I would recommend it if you can handle the content in it. One other thing to say about this is there is a mystery element to this where she is assisting in figuring out who a serial killer is. However, Mindy McGinnis is an author who is less interested in genre and more interested in ideas. So one frustration that I saw some people have was that as a mystery, it's okay, but it's not that great. And I would say, well, yeah, that's probably true, but it's really because she's more interested in the ideas that she's exploring here about gender and mental illness and abuse and power and morality. That's really what this book is about. The mystery is just part of what keeps things moving along. And it is interesting. I liked it. But if, yeah, like, of course, it's not that hard to figure out what's going to happen. It's pretty basic, but I think it's a good book. So I gave this one four stars. My next four star read is a short story collection. This is How Long Till Black Future Month by N.K. Jemisin. I am so happy that I finally got around to this. I listened to this one on the audio. It's been on my TBR for a while. I love N.K. Jemisin. She is one of my all-time favorite sci-fi fantasy authors. Her Broken Earth trilogy is entirely brilliant. It's amazing. And I think this is a really good short story collection. It has 16 or 17 different stories in it. And it's always hard to rate short story collections because there's so much variation in it. In general, I liked most everything in here. So I thought it deserved four stars. Although obviously some of the stories are stronger than others. If you want to hear about a couple of my favorites, I do talk about them in my Goodreads review. But yeah, I think this really shows the diversity of the types of things she writes or can write from urban fantasy to high fantasy. There is even one story that's set in the world of the Broken Earth trilogy and you get cameos from from some characters if you've read that. One that's kind of like steampunky. I just really enjoyed it. Like some of them I loved and some of them were fine. So overall I gave it four stars. I'm happy that I finally read it. And my final four star read this month I read as an e-arc. It was sent to me from the publisher and I may be doing an interview or something with this author in the future. It is another YA debut novel called I Hope You Get This Message by Farah Nas Rishi. There was a lot that I really loved about this book and I'm glad that I read it. I will say that while it is technically speculative fiction, for the most part it reads kind of like a heavy YA contemporary, it basically is asking the question of what would you do and what would the people in the world do if we found out that the world was going to end in a matter of days, that aliens exist and are possibly going to wipe out humanity in like a week. And so it's kind of exploring those questions through the perspectives of three teenagers whose lives end up intertwining in unexpected and interesting ways. I think it's really interesting. I think it's done really well. The teenagers that are the main characters in this book all have experienced a lot of trauma in their lives. And for them, part of this is 
how might you seek closure or healing or what things might matter to you at the end of the world when you've got trauma and things in your past and brokenness. And so this is another one where there's going to be a lot of content warnings to be aware of, including things like a past suicide attempt and different forms of violence and theft and homophobia. It is pretty intense, but I do think it is also really good. This is own voices for American Muslim Pakistani representation, and one of the teenagers, Adim, is an American Muslim boy who is trying to find his sister who has disappeared and not been connected with their family for a lot of years ever since she came out to them as gay and the way that that was handled. Those issues are explored in a really nuanced and complex way, and it's really beautiful. And as dark as this book gets, there is a thread of hope throughout it, and I love the way that that's kind of woven in throughout the story. One of the other main characters is a boy who is gay but doesn't let anybody close to him. He's got kind of a series of hookups. He doesn't let his mom close to him. He doesn't let his therapist close to him. He's got a lot of pain in his past and trauma and identity issues and different things that he's working through. His mom works all the time, is underpaid. They have bills racking up. There's just, there's a lot going on there. And then finally we have a girl named Kate who never knew her dad and is basically taking care of her mom who is schizophrenic and sometimes on and off her medications and trying to hide the fact that everything is falling to pieces for her at home. Included in this book is a sort of apocalyptic road trip fraught with lots of danger and crazy things happening. There's a lot of dealing with pain and the end of the world and what things are like and the ending is kind of ambiguous you don't really know necessarily what's going to happen next but I think that's intentional there is a line in the book that I think really well encapsulates what this book is doing and it is a reimagining of a line of poetry from Rumi and I think what she says is something like your pain is the place that the light enters you and I think that's really what this book is doing. It is a book about pain, about trauma, but also about the possibility of hope and healing. And so as dark as it gets, there's this through line of hope that is really beautiful, even as heart-wrenching as it can be. So I ended up giving this one four stars. Next I had five books that I gave four and a half stars, and two of them are books that I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. Those are The Winner's Curse, which I talked about earlier, and The Water Dancer by ta Coates. I also gave four and a half stars to Race to the Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse. I am so glad that I finally got around to reading this and I really enjoyed it. It was such a good time. This book is about to come out. It is one of the newest books in the Rick Riordan Presents imprint, which is publishing Own Voices mythology stories. And this one is about a girl who is Native American and it includes Navajo mythology. I really, really liked this. It is solidly written for a middle grade audience. I know some middle grade books are written with adults in mind. This one definitely feels like it is written for middle graders, and it is a really fun, fast paced adventure full of this mythology with a great heroine, and it's just a lot of fun. It's about a girl who finds out that she is a monster hunter or is intended to be, and she can sense monsters. And so when she meets her dad's new potential boss, she knows that he is is actually a monster in disguise. One thing that I think is kind of funny about this is that the big bad in the story is this guy who is a monster disguised as a businessman who runs a company that uses fracking to get at gas, um, which I think is kind of cool and kind of funny at the same time that that's like the big bad of the story. I do think there was a little bit of a missed opportunity there to kind of explain to kids this age what fracking is and why it's a problem for the environment because that wasn't really done here. However, I will say this is an advanced reader copy so it's entirely possible that that could have been bulked up in the finished product, but at least in the ARC copy that was never really talked much about. But in general, this was fun. It's just a quick, fast-paced fantasy adventure about family and love and friendship and how to deal with bullying. And um, yeah, really, really liked it. Four and a half stars. My next four and a half star read was my one nonfiction pick of the month, which I really loved. And I actually recommend this in my nonfiction November recommendations video, which I'll link up above if you want to check it out. I read this as a buddy read with Brie Hill during Spookathon. And this is Monster She Wrote, The Women Who Pioneered Horror and Speculative Fiction by Lisa Kroger and Melanie R. Anderson. I really love this. This was sent to me for review by Quirk Books. It's a really beautiful book as just like a physical object, but it's also super interesting. It's 
fun and accessible and it's broken up really well. It's easy to read. We read it in sections. Um, so it talks about these women who are just really, really fascinating. Section one is the founding mothers, and so this is women from the 1600s through the Victorian period, and you'll get a few pages on each of them. And then you get a reading list, and so it'll give you ideas of books by each of the authors that are worth checking out and picking up, and you will definitely come out of this with a much larger TBR. I now have so many more books that I'm interested in reading. I think this is so well curated and edited. It's got a light tone to it, so it's interesting, but it's also fun and easy to read. I will say some sections are definitely better than others. I was less interested in a couple of them, like the Pulp Fiction one. I felt like the bios on the women were kind of lacking and it was like less interesting to me. It is possible that that's just because we don't have as much info on the women who were authors in that genre. Um, so yeah, like there was a little bit of ups and downs, but overall really loved it. Definitely recommend it if these are genres that you're at all interested in. It was really good. Four and a half stars. And my final four and a half star read this month was another graphic novel. This is Teen Titans Raven by Cami Garcia. I really enjoyed this a lot. I got this as an advanced reader copy at Book Expo from DC Comics, and this is part of their new line DC Inc., which is doing backstory on different characters from the DC universe for teenagers, and so this is a reimagining of the backstory of Raven, and I really liked it a lot. It's got a diverse cast of characters, it's interesting, it's compelling, it's fast-paced, and the way it ends, I hope we get more. Honestly, I would read more. Like, this so far is probably my favorite thing that I have read from this line. I really, really loved it. Definitely gave this one four and a half stars and would recommend picking it up if this is something you're interested in. Next, let's talk about my five star reads. This month I had five of them and three were discussed in my mid-month wrap up. The ones that I talk about there are The School for Good and Evil, A Crystal of Time by Soman Chinani, Washington Black by Essie Adugian, and I also have a standalone book review that I pulled from my mid-month wrap-up if you just want to hear me talk about this because I had a lot to say about it, so I will link that up above if you want to check it out. And finally, The Wallflower Wager by Tessa Dare. Then I had two other books that I gave five stars to this month. The first one is Etched in Bone by Ann Bishop. This is the fifth and final book in the Written and Read series, and I really loved it. I think this returned to what I loved so much about the first two books in the series, which is that it limited the scope of the book, where most of what we were focused on here was what was happening in the lakeside courtyard. This one is quite intense. There's going to be a lot of content warnings in here. Um, all of the books have content warnings. This one I think even more so, but I really loved it. I liked the way that it wrapped up. I do think that people who've been shipping Meg and Simon throughout the entire series, it's a super, super, super slow burn romance. And while they do end up together, I mean, it's, it's paranormal romance. I don't feel bad about saying that. Like they do end up together, but it's like a few paragraphs, pretty brief. You don't get a extended explanation of that relationship finally coming to fruition. So I think some people have been a little bit disappointed with that. I didn't really mind. I liked it. I love this whole series. It's really cozy. And um, yeah, I just think it's really great. It's definitely a favorite series for me. And this one was five stars. And my final five star read of the month, I loved. I'm glad I finally got around to this. I ended up listening to this one as an audiobook and then went ahead and purchased a finished copy because I just really liked it a lot and I think I'm definitely going to want to continue on in the series. I think it might just be a duology. I really, really, really hope that somebody picks this up and turns it into a TV show because it would be such a good TV show. This is The Good Luck Girls by Charlotte Nicole Davis. This is her debut fantasy western about a girl gang on the run and seeking revenge and angry ghosts, and it's just so much fun. It's interesting because in some ways this is dealing with really heavy topics like sex trafficking, but it's also just like a really, really fun book. It would make such a good TV show, guys. It's very cinematic, and the way that the plot is structured, it would really be easy to see it broken up into episodes, and exploring the world more would be super cool. It follows this group of five girls who are known as Good Luck Girls, and in this world, Good Luck Girls are sold to welcome houses, which are 
essentially brothels when they're very young and while they're young girls they work as servants but on their 16th birthday their virginity is basically auctioned away to the highest bidder and they then work as sex slaves in the welcome house until they're like 40 or something. So this is mainly from the perspective of Aster, but we do get some occasional perspectives from her younger sister, Clementine. The male clients in the welcome houses are known as Braggs, and Aster has now been working servicing Braggs in this welcome house for two years and is concerned about her younger sister, Clementine, and is kind of wondering if there's a way for her to protect her from having to deal with the same thing that she is dealing with. The story opens on Clementine's 16th birthday, the night that she's basically been auctioned off and she accidentally murders the guy that she's with. <laughs> <laughs> and so that basically starts this whole chain of events where her, her sister, and three other girls from the Welcome House go on the run in this world where there's like angry vengeance seeking ghosts and stuff, trying to seek vengeance and trying to find this mythological ghost woman who can remove these tattoos from their necks that are magical and show them to be basically the slaves of these welcome houses. There's a lot here. I, talk, I go into more detail in my Goodreads review, but I really liked this a lot. I would have liked to maybe see more character development of more of the side characters. I think we get pretty good development of Aster, whose perspective we're mostly in, and of Violet, uh, who is her kind of enemy at the welcome house, but you know, maybe there's some chemistry there. Maybe, maybe. There's also like a really, really sweet burgeoning romance between two of the other girls that develops while they're on the run, and Clementine starts developing feelings for a very nice young man, but her older sister has some feelings about that and has a hard time with it because, for obvious reasons, has a hard time trusting men. And so this is really getting at some like big issues, but the focus in this book is really more on the plot and the action and this kind of like fun western adventure. Uh, there's a bank robbery, there's like, it's great. It's it's like, it's a whole lot of fun. I would have loved to get a little bit more character development than what we got, but I still gave this five stars. Please somebody turn this into a TV show and I would definitely read on in the series. So finally, we have come to the two books that I gave six stars this month, which for me a six star rating means that something is a favorite of the year or favorite of all time. In this case, these are books that are gonna make my favorites of the year list. One of them I don't own physically, I read it as an e-arc and I loved it, but I may end up purchasing a copy of this book I thought it was so good. This is Beyond the Black Door by A.M. Strickland. So this is such an interesting book. In a lot of ways this is a dark fantasy romance and I think a lot of people have been a little bit confused by that because one of the things that people have talked about is that the heroine of the story is asexual. Yes, she is. She is asexual by romantic. And one of my favorite things about this book is that I think it does such a great job, among other things, I mean there's a lot that I love about this book, which I will get into actually, but one of the things I love about it is that it does a really really good job of unpacking the difference between being interested in sex and being interested in romance. And the main character in the story kind of discovers those things about herself through the process. It also talks a lot about gender and the way that those things can fall on a spectrum from being trans to being gender non-binary and that that sexuality and gender so many different things are normal and that part of this is just about the process of figuring out like who you are and where you fall on that line and there's like a whole scene about it which some people apparently found really annoying but I loved it and I thought it was really beautiful where this priestess uses this moon chart to help explain like where people fall along these different spectrums and I loved it I thought it was so great also, I found this book to be such a page turner. I could not get enough of it. I needed to know what was going to happen. It's so interesting. The main character of the book is what's called a soul walker, which means that when she's asleep, if she's physically close to another person, she can walk in their soul and suss out their secrets. Her mother is also a soul walker, and the way that she uses this is by being a pleasure artist, which is a form of sex worker where she basically sells people's secrets that she learns through this process. But for our main character, she's not interested in sex and needs to find her own path to 
figuring out what this means for her and how to be a soul walker and what that looks like. Now, the other thing that's interesting is that when she's soul walking, there's this mysterious black door that follows her wherever she goes. And when she's a little girl, her mother tells her, never open the black door. It's dangerous, never open the black door, but doesn't tell her what's behind it. So of course, the day comes when she opens the black door. And the question is like, what happens? What is beyond the black door? And it's so good. It's so good. Like I kept turning the pages and had to know what happens. Um, one other thing that I really, really love about this book, because like I said, it is a kind of dark fantasy romance. And one of the things it kind of grapples with is that while you may not be able to choose who you love, you can choose what you do about it. And I think that's such an important message, especially for a YA audience, at least for me it was, because I certainly was not always interested in the healthiest people or was involved in the healthiest relationships, but understanding that choice in what you choose to do with those things I think is so important. Um, so I was really into this. I loved it. It's like one of my favorite books of the year and it's one that I could totally see myself rereading, which is why I think I want to own a copy. So yeah, if that sounds interesting to you, highly recommend. Um, this is another one that I'm like, it might not be the book for everyone, but I was all about it. So good. So yeah, Asexual by Romantic Heroine. Um, six stars for me, guys six stars. Finally, my second six star read of the month is another one that I think is going to be pretty polarizing and that is quite dark, but I really, really loved it. And that is Ninth House by Leigh Bardugo. Um, okay, so I listened to this on audio. And after talking to some other people, I feel like that was a good choice for me. I think that that probably did add to my experience with this book. Um, this is definitely not going to be the book for everyone. A lot of people are saying it's really dark, it's definitely adult, it's not YA. All of that is very, very true. The other thing that I would say about this is this book is kind of literary as well. And I think stylistically, that is not going to appeal to everyone. So while this book is kind of this witchy urban fantasy about secret societies at Yale and magic and stuff, I think at its core, this is really a book about ideas. And I think because of that, and because of the way that it's written, and the ideas that she's exploring here make it feel in some ways more like literary fiction. So this may not be the Lee Bardugo you're used to, this may not be the right book for everyone, um, but I really really loved it, I really resonated with it, and I think for me a lot of the ideas that she was exploring here were ones that I care a lot about and I liked the way that she was handling them. Um, definitely there's going to be a lot of really big content warnings in this, it is quite dark, there is on the page rape and sexual assault, including the rape of a minor at 12 and at 15. Um, so do be aware that those things are in there. It's It can be quite intense. There's also the use of a sort of magical date rape drug, and that is again something that we see on screen it's pretty pretty like there's there's a lot there's a lot of that in general i think that this book is really about power and privilege and the way that they intersects with gender race poverty and sexual assault um, this is very much a book for the me too era and it's about the way that sexual assault happens and then is handled or mishandled on campus and in institutions of higher learning. The way that things are sometimes brushed under the rug or covered up for financial gain or for reasons of power. Um, I think that all of that is really brought to the surface here. There's also a plot twist in this book that I think the intention of it and the point of it is really about the fact that we need an intersectional feminism, that white feminism is isn't enough and it oppresses women of color. Um, yeah, so this is like a really intense, deep book. It is quite slow paced. There is a mystery element to it. There are a lot of these kind of like dark secret societies at Yale that do these kind of evil types of magic, but at its core it is a book about power and the abuse of power. So I loved it. I think it is quite gritty. It is not what I was expecting and probably not what a lot of people are expecting, but ultimately I was a huge fan and for me this was definitely a favorite of the year. So yeah. Your mileage is going to vary on this one, uh, but I really, really loved it. So there you have it. Those are the 25 books that I read in the month of October. I am really pleased with how my reading went. There was like a good bit of variation, but I read some really, really amazing things. And so far November is starting off really strong. I've got a couple of amazing books that I'm getting into. So I'm really excited and hopeful that the rest of the year will finish out really well. 
Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on any of the books that I talked about today. And for your question of the day, why don't we talk about content warnings? I think this would be an interesting conversation to have. Are there content warnings that you pay close attention to? Are they something that you find to be personally useful? For me, there are specific things that I like to know going into a book are in it. Otherwise, I might have a hard time with it. And there are certain things that I might avoid altogether. So I don't have a lot of like trigger content warnings that will actually affect whether or not I'll read a book, but there are a few. And there are a few things that might cause me to DNF things. So let me know kind of your thoughts on that issue and whether there's something that you make use of in the comments down below. If you guys like this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.